Hey everyone, um, it's Tiffany and I know it's super late. Uh, I had told you guys that I was going to give you an update today. So even though it's like 1049 at night in California, which is tomorrow on the East Coast, um, I wanted to keep my promise and give you guys uh, an update on what's going on with Terry. Because I haven't told a whole lot of people what's going on um, just because the last couple days have been crazy. Um... And I have another early call in the morning, so I will try to make this fairly quick. Um, so basically, I run on coffee these days. Uh, so basically, uh, Terry went out uh, to an appointment this this past weekend. And as you guys know, um, he's beat lymphoma twice. Um, he's done an incredible amount of rehab. He was originally... Um, diagnosed with lymphoma in 2022 and, um, hi Tim. And, um, so he was originally diagnosed with lymphoma in 2022. At the time, the lymphoma, his immune system, when his immune system crashed, it immediately attacked his mobility and his, his, his spinal cord, his ability to walk, all of that good stuff. Um, not so good at the time. Um, but since 2022 in the last two years, he has beat lymphoma twice. Uh, he has worked his butt off, uh, to get his mobility back. Um, he got to the point to where he is able to use the walker, um, to get up from the bed himself, get from the bed into the wheelchair, get from the wheelchair into our stair, stair elevators that we have built inside the house. Um, we bought a mobility van. So all of these things combined um, with Terry's mobility, uh, he and I have been able to go to his appointments and do things that we need to do on our own without transport or paying for transport, which is like $2,000 a trip. So last weekend, um, we went out to an appointment. When we got up and we left, Terry was fine. Um, he had been feeling a little, a little under the weather during the week. Um, he had a 103 degree temperature on Wednesday, but then it kind of went away. And so we figured he was okay. And when we went out, he was strong. He got up out of the bed himself, got into the wheelchair himself. Everything was good. Um, we went to LA, went to the appointment. Everything was fine at the appointment. But then when we left LA and headed back home, which is about a two hour drive, he started not feeling so good. Um, he started feeling weak and tired and kind of shaky and we were like, oh, okay, well maybe, you know, maybe you are under the weather or maybe it's just been a long day. Um, when we got home though, uh, Terry had lost his mobility. He, his strength was gone. Um, he had lost the ability to stand. Um, he and I managed to get him into the stair elevator and get him to the top of our staircase. Um, but he did not have the strength once we were at the top of the staircase to stand and lift himself out of the elevator chair to get back into the wheelchair. We tried for probably a good 20 minutes. His legs were just jelly. There was no strength there. He couldn't do it. He started running another fever. He was stressed and all of this kind of stuff. And he was essentially stranded in the wheelchair uh, the stair chair, the stair elevator, elevator, lift elevator chair thing. Yeah. Um, so we ended up having to call the fire department to come out and help us get him from the elevator chair into the wheelchair and then back into the bed because I can't lift him and he couldn't lift himself. And it was in a real dangerous position because he was stranded at the top of our staircase. So fire department came out, helped. We got him back into bed. Uh, we spent the next couple of days just kind of resting up. We had assumed like, okay, he was probably just tired from the trip. Um, the very next day, Terry wanted to try to stand uh, by the bed and see if his, you know, if he'd rested up, see if his strength had come back. Um, and he still wasn't able to do it. So at this point, I started talking with his uh, team of doctors at USC and telling them, this is what happened. You know, you guys know you saw him, he was okay. But then when we got home, this is, this is what we were seeing. And what do you think this might be? Um, 
And so the USC doctors had told us that they think that he should go into um, some kind of urgent care or emergency room right away and be evaluated because with the sudden lack of strength, um, one of their concerns, or actually both of them had said they were concerned, that Terry might have gotten a spinal cord compression, which means that something happens in your spine where your vertebrae or your spine itself twists or compresses and pinches the bundle of nerves that spirals down your spine. And if that was the case, then they need to know immediately because they either have to treat it with steroids and injections, cortisone injections, shots, or in severe cases, they, they, they do surgery to re relieve the pressure. Um, however, before we got into the hospital to try to figure that out, uh, here comes Tuesday. And on Tuesday, um, when well Monday night he was starting to feel a little bit worse and then Tuesday um he woke up and he I could see he was having labored breathing like his chest was heaving so I uh started taking his oxygen levels and uh Terry's oxygen for because he has a trach and he's on oxygen his normal level is anything from 92 to 95 and Terry was dropping and he dropped into the 80s and then he dropped even lower and at one point he had gotten as low as 78. Now anything under 88 of an oxygen level, uh, they say you should go to the ER immediately because anything under 88 can be considered dangerous. You can start having all kinds of damage to organs and problems if it's under 88. He was at 78. So on Tuesday, we called uh, the ambulance and said he needs to go to the hospital. His oxygen is dropping. He's having trouble breathing. He can't stand. Um, so you guys are going to have to, to get him down the stairs yourself. Like, he can't help you. And so the paramedics and the fire department came. They got him down into the ambulance. And they basically said, okay, well which hospital do you want us to take him to? So we had our choice, and of course they said they wouldn't take us to either of the two hospitals that we asked to go to. USC, they said, was too far away, which we kind of figured it was. But the other one was Henry Mayo, which is in Santa Clarita, and they wouldn't take us there either. They said it was too far away, which I find ridiculous because we're actually right smack dab in the middle of Palmdale and Santa Clarita, but whatever. Uh, so they said, okay, well, you have a choice. Uh, we can take you to Palmdale Regional or we can take you to AV Hospital. Uh, we didn't want to go to either of these. AV Hospital is the hospital that Terry's dad, my grandfather, passed away at um, and passed away because they did a procedure that they shouldn't have done. And my grandfather aspirated on the table and went into a coma and never came out. Uh, however, Palmdale Regional we had just had a problem with Terry directly had had a problem with just two years ago because in 2022, when Terry was originally having the health problems, it was Palmdale Regional that my father had been taken to. And that was the hospital that we've told all of you guys about that we had the issues with to where my dad was there for like a week. They weren't figuring anything out. They didn't know what was going on. Um, the doctor looked at me in the room in front of my father and said, I don't know what you want me to do. And I said, what I want you to do is give me some answers. He's been here a week and I don't know what's going on. And the doctor in front of my father said, your dad is dying. I don't know what part of that you don't understand. So then after I went full Virgo bitch on him, um, then the the next thing, which was the arguably the worst thing that happened was, uh, I left visiting hours. I came back the next morning. My dad was comatose. He, I could not wake him up. And I asked what happened. And they said, oh, your father was unruly. And we had to give him Ativan, which was completely ridiculous because my father was bed bound. How unruly can somebody get who can't get up and like reach you? I mean, take a step back, right? Like he can't reach you. Um, but they gave him Ativan, and at the time he used a CPAP machine, and he went to sleep on the Ativan, and nobody put the CPAP mask on him, and he ended up gassing himself. So 
after the full day of being there and I said, something is not right. Like we can't wake him up. They gave him two doses of reversal medicine. Nothing worked. Um, I told them you guys need to do a AVG, which is a blood gas test on him. They did the AVG and then they called me as soon as I got home and said, your father's CO2, CO level is three times what it should be and we need to intubate him right now or he will die. So I had no choice. I said, go ahead and intubate him. And then he was intubated and went into a coma for three weeks. And um, they couldn't get him stable. They couldn't get him out of the coma. They couldn't extubate him because he wasn't stable. And um, if he would have stayed there, he would have died at their hands. And luckily in 2022, I had an angel fall in my lap who was a gal who came on site uh, at Palmdale Regional Medical Center from City of Hope. And she came to me and she said, look, she's like, we need to get your dad out of here. She's like, your dad, your dad has lymphoma. She's like, this place does not know how to diagnose him. They do not know how to treat him. They do not know how to deal with cases like this. And she's like, they've treated you horribly and they've made some really ne neglectful mistakes. So she's like, if I have your permission, I want to try to get him transferred to USC Norris. They're a, a remarkable cancer center. And I said, yes, please, 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 anything, anything you can do to help. And she had him, she warned me. She's like, you know, transfers can take weeks because you have to deal with medical insurance, bureaucratic BS. And, um, God was on her side because she had my dad transferred and out of there and down to USC within 36 hours. So anyway, that's our history with Palmdale Regional. We did not want to go to Palmdale Regional because we truly felt that if it had not been for USC two years ago, stepping in and bringing my dad back from death's door, that my dad would have died at Palmdale Regional. And yes, they said right in front of him that he, he was dying which wasn't even the case. They didn't even have a cancer center. They didn't even know what they were talking about. Um, so uh, we told the ambulance, now coming back to present, uh, we told the ambulance, we don't want to go to Palmdale Regional, take him to AV Hospital. We don't want to, but it's better than Palmdale Regional. So they said, okay, started to, to drive him, sirens running because his oxygen was dropping, dropping, dropping. And as I'm following them in the van, I get a call and the ambulance calls me and says, um, we can't take him to AV hospital because AV hospital is closed. They are not accepting patients in the ER. I don't know if it was because they were full or what was going on, but they said we can't take him there. We have to take him to Palmdale Regional. So here we go again. So, um, on Tuesday around 2.30, um, we ended up in the emergency room at Palmdale Regional. Um, the bullshittery <laughs> started immediately because my dad has been a trach patient under the care of the pulmonology, pulmonology team at USC for two years now. Um, they have always had him on oxygen with the oxygen mask over the trach. You guys have seen pictures. Um, he's never had a problem with his level and all of a sudden, uh, the respiratory therapist at Palmdale Regional is saying she knows more than USC and no, no patient with a trach who wears a speaking valve should have the oxygen going here. It should be a nasal cannula, which we had been told before, no, don't do a nasal cannula because nasal cannulas only go to your upper part of your lungs and we want the oxygen to get to the lower part, which is why it would go through the trach. So she starts changing that. They're changing everything. Oh, don't do this. Don't do this. We know better. Blah, 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 blah. Whatever. They do end up getting my dad's oxygen level back up to, to normal. And the doctors come in. And they run some tests, do some scans. And they say, well, we don't think that USC knows what they're talking about. We don't think it has anything to do with the spine. <clears throat> we just think that your dad is weak because your dad has pneumonia. And they said, the good news is, is that the pneumonia is in only in one lung. It's in the right lung. Um, and we caught it before it spread to the other lung. So they're like, we're going to admit him. And it'll be a couple of days of, of antibiotics because we need to get this under control. And then he should be fine. Okay. 
So they start running antibiotics on him in an IV right away. And we're sitting in the ER for probably, probably about six hours. And finally they get a room and they admit him. Now on the way to admitting him to the room, they say, we're going to stop by CT and take a CT scan of your lungs. Okay, fine. So we stop at the CT scan. While he's in the CT scan, his oxygen starts dropping again. Then we finally get him in the room. We start, you know, doing whatever we can. We get the oxygen back up, but he's, he's not comfortable. He's shaky. He's not as calm and stable as he was in the emergency room now that he's in a room room. So I stay there a couple more hours. We've now been there almost 12 hours. And um, before I leave, like he's good. He's stable. He, they've now put a face mask on him. So the oxygen is going in the nose and in the mouth. And he's not comfortable, but at least his levels were okay. They were, his oxygen was stable. We're like, okay, you're good. We're just going to do the antibiotics. And then, you know, hopefully your strength will come back because that's what they're saying, that this is all because of the pneumonia. And then we'll, we'll bring you home. No problem. So I leave uh, Palmdale Regional at about 10 o'clock last night, a little after 10. And I get home and uh, I'm only about maybe 20, 30 minutes from Palmdale Regional, get home. And I'm only in the house for about five, 10 minutes and I get a call from Palmdale Regional. Here we go, this is the same pattern that I had with them two years ago. As soon as I get home, all of a sudden, as soon as I leave the hospital, everything goes to shit. So um, I get a call from his nurse who is in a calm way panicking and saying, hi, Tiffany, I needed to call you because we turned your father's oxygen up all the way and we're not being able to get his numbers to stay where they're supposed to. So we're sending him over to ICU and they're talking about wanting to intubate him. Oh, intubation seems to be their favorite fucking thing. Um, so I said, okay, no, no, no. I said, nobody is to intubate him until I talk to who is wanting to do this and I find out why. And she's like, okay, well, I don't really know anything because I'm not in ICU. I'm just in telemetry. So they're sending him to ICU. He's going to be in this room number and, and, and they're getting him over there now. I said, okay, I need to have the nurse from ICU call me immediately. So then maybe 15 minutes later, I get a call. Uh, Tim, intubation, what that is, is they put, they put, two tubes down you. Uh, the main tube is the tube that goes in your mouth and down your throat. Um, and that is to open up your airways, get oxygen in and get any negative gas like CO, CO2 out. So it's basically is it's very barbaric. Uh, it, it's a, a giant tube that they put down your throat, down your mouth, down your throat to open up your airway and it goes into your lungs. And then they put a second smaller tube down your nose and down into your stomach because you're sitting there when you're intubated, you're sitting there and your mouth is open like you're a pig with an apple in your mouth. You can't chew, you can't swallow, you can't eat. So the tube in the nose is to go to your stomach so that they can feed you with liquid food while you're intubated. Yeah, it's, it's horrendous. Uh, Tim, if you go on the GoFundMe page, the picture that you see with Terry with the things on his cheeks and the, the tube down his, that's when he was intubated two years ago. And Palmdale Regional is wanting to do this, wanting to do this again. So uh, the ICU nurse calls me and she goes, hi, I, you know, I'm so-and-so. I'm from uh, Palmdale Regional ICU and we just got your dad uh, situated and checked into ICU and his, um, you know, his level, his oxygen levels aren't where they need to be. So we're talking about wanting to intubate him. And I said, okay, first of all, nobody intubates him. We need to have a conversation first. I said, why are you wanting to intubate him? I said, he was fine when I left the hospital. And she said, well, because they had the oxygen up on the wall all the way. And his level wasn't where it was, where his oxygen level wasn't as high as it needed to be. And we, we don't know why. So we're wanting to intubate him because we're afraid he's going to code, which means they're saying he's at a risk of, of dying, basically. 
And I said, okay, wh what's his oxygen at? And she goes, his oxygen's at, at 91. And, and she goes, it should be between 95 and 100. And I said, no, it shouldn't be. I said, my father is a trach patient who is on oxygen. My dad's normal oxygen level is between 91 and 95. He's not normally ever between 95 and 100. And if he is, it's a damn good day. His normal is 91 to 95. I said, furthermore, I said, what is considered dangerous for oxygen levels is anything under 88. So I said, if he's at 91, A, that's normal for him. And B, unless he drops under 88, I don't want to hear the word intubation come out of your mouth because he's not in danger and I'm not going to authorize an intubation. And she goes, oh, and I, so 91 to 95 is what's normal for a trach patient? Oh, good to know. And I'm thinking, I didn't go to school for this. Why am I telling the professional that is probably the hospital is getting thousands of dollars to take care of my father and they don't know this? So I try to collect myself and I say, um, yeah, no, 91 to 95 is normal for him. I said 95 to 100 is normal for normal people. But I said, I can tell you right out that even I don't always read out that high. I've never read out at 100. I'm usually around 97. And so I said, so to expect a trach patient who's on oxygen to read out at that is completely ridiculous. And it is not a valid basis to say you need to intubate him. And then I said, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why we feel like this. And I told her the whole story of what happened two years ago. And I said, so that's why you're getting this attitude from me. And I said, furthermore, I want you to know that nothing is to be done with my dad without my permission. Nothing. Then she started talking about wanting to give my dad out of van. Here we go. Second thing, ding, 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 twice in a row. Out of van is the drug that they gave him two years ago that put him to sleep. They ended up causing him to gas himself, which ended up causing them to have to intubate him. So I said, no. Nobody is allowed to give my dad Ativan. We've done that. It doesn't work. He passes out. His CO goes through the roof. Um, he's a CO retainer because he, he doesn't fully exhale. Um, and absolutely not. I don't, and she goes, well, he has anxiety. I said, he has anxiety because he's there. And you guys tried to kill him two years ago. So I said, nope. Don't, don't do anything. I said, you, you are there to give him antibiotics and to monitor his level. If his oxygen level is not below 88, there is no reason to be concerned. And I do not want him hassled. Okay, fine. So then I hang up the phone with them. I immediately start sending out emails to all of the doctors that we've known for, for years now at USC, telling them what's going on. A pulmonology team, the respiratory therapist, two of them that we're friends with, uh, the oncologist, the hematologist, the hematologist person. Just, okay, they're trying to undo, and I'm telling USC, I said, you guys remember what my dad was like when he came in two years ago. They are trying to undo everything you did to bring him back from death's door. So I need help. I, I need direction. I need advice. We need to get him out of there. Um, then, so I call, <laughs> I call Palmdale Regional at six in the morning on Tuesday or Wednesday morning this morning to check up on him. And the nurse says, Oh, his, his levels are better. His heart rate is good. His oxygen is good. But he's having trouble putting together full sentences. And I said, why? And she goes, I don't know. I think it's just the congestion in his chest. And she goes, which actually <coughs> is something that our doctor on call on the ICU floor wants to talk to you about. <coughs> and I said, okay. So she gets this doctor on the phone with me. This is a doctor uh, named Dr. Patel. And he starts talking to me about a procedure that he wants to do on my father. 
And he said, you know, there's a lot of fluid on your dad's lungs because of the pneumonia. So we want to do this procedure. I don't remember the name of it. But basically what they want to do is they want to drain the fluid that is on my dad's lungs. And what the process is, is they take a needle and they, a syringe basically, and they stick it in your back <clears throat> to get to the fluid because your lungs, you can access your lungs from your back and they take it out with the syringe. The problem with that though, is that the risk is that they may stick the wrong thing and puncture your lung. And I said, I, no, <laughs> I said, absolutely not. I said, <clears throat> he's had fluid on his lungs before. And I said, they usually just give him a diuretic to slough it off, which is a pee pill. It makes you pee a lot. When you pee a lot, it gets the excess fluid in your body. And he goes, well, yeah, he goes, but you know, that could take days. Versus if we did this, it would make your dad feel better right away. And I said, yeah, unless you hit the wrong thing and you puncture his lung and then he aspirates like my grandfather did. And he goes, oh, well, the, the, you know, that's a risk, but it's not common. I said, well, it wasn't common to have you guys do what you did to him two years ago either. But I said, the problem is we don't trust you guys anymore. And I, and I said, have you talked to my dad about this? Because Terry obviously is lucid. He, he, and he goes, yeah, I talked to Terry and Terry told me no. And I'm like, well, he's like, I just really think, I said, the answer is no. So I hung up with him. Apparently on the backside, this doctor was going in and trying to talk my dad into it, even though my dad was basically saying no and stop fucking asking me. And the doctor was getting mad. So <clears throat> I get off the phone with him and then I get start calling USC again and I get on the phone with our respiratory therapist and our pulmonologist and I say um I I need your guys's advice because now this is what Palmdale Regional is saying they want to do and I said I don't feel comfortable with this what would you guys say do you feel this is safe and they say to me no we do not want Palmdale Regional to do that. And in fact, um, here is what I want you to do. When you get to the hospital today, I want you to talk to the doctor, tell them that you spoke with us and that your dad has a very long and complicated his medical history with us. And uh, he needs a higher level of care and we want him transferred down here to USC. Here's the transfer number. Give them the number. Tell them to call and start the process. Okay? That's exactly what I wanted to hear. So then I get to the hospital. And that was basically my day. <coughs> Sorry. That was basically my day today is trying to get that whole thing processed because it's there's so many people that have to be involved and so many hoops that you have to jump through. And, of course, Dr. Patel didn't want to do it. And he's like, well... He's like, uh, you know, I can ask them if they want to do this. But really, you know, there's no reason why we would initiate this because we can do everything here that they can do at USC. And I said, well, there is a reason to initiate it because the patient wants to go to USC. I, the patient's family wants the patient to go to USC. And USC wants the patient to come to them because they've already been treating him for two years. So I said, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you this is what is going to be done. And he's like, okay, well, I need to. I was like, no, no, no. I was like, what do you need from USC? I will get you what you need. And this, well, we need to talk to the case manager. Okay, fine. So the case manager comes up, gives me the same kind of attitude. And I look at him. I said, look, I'm going to be real honest with you. And I told him the whole history of what happened with Palmdale Regional. And I said, honestly, we should have sued your guys' ass and owned this hospital two years ago. Because you almost killed my father. So I said, I, again, I'm not asking you. His doctors want him down there for continuation of care. And he wants to go down there. I said, so you can either do this or he'll, he'll sign himself out and I'll just drive him down there myself. Or you can have him go by ambulance, which is arguably going to be the safer way for him since he is on IVs and he does have pneumonia. So finally, after arguing all day, <laughs> finally got around seven o'clock 
uh, got the word that all of the paperwork had been filed and that USC had accepted him as a patient. So now we just, the last two steps is USC has to have an open bed for him, which they're working on. And then after that, then Palmdale Regional starts working on booking transport to get him moved to USC. We were hoping it was going to get done today. Didn't get done today. We're thinking he will be moved or he better be moved tomorrow. So tomorrow he will be transported back down to LA to USC. <clears throat> and once we get there, then they will be continuing the antibiotics for his pneumonia. They will be taking care of his lungs. His other doctors want to get some additional tests just to make sure there's nothing else going on since Palmdale didn't look into any of the stuff that I asked them to look into. And uh, we will feel much better and much safer once he is back in the hands of USC because this is now the second time we've had the same problem with Palmdale Regional and it's just a nightmare. And I'm, I really honestly have been kind of summarizing, even though this is a long video, because there's so much other stuff they did. I mean, you know, uh, trying to force him to have a catheter, even though he did have a catheter, but it was hurting, so they had him take it out, so they were trying to force him to have it again, threatening him, saying, you know, if you don't do this, then we'll have to put the catheter in. Uh, turning around, they, they changed his trach out. They literally took the tube, the trach, the entire trach. They took it out and put a new one in that is a smaller size, which is more uncomfortable. It hurts him more. And also, I now don't have the tools I need to care for his trach at home because all of the tools I have is for the trach they took out. And threw away without my permission. They lost his speaking valve, which is like a $125 value that I pay for out of pocket. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. Plus the belligerence and the basic, the basic feeling of we're going to do what we think is best, which is we're going to sedate you. We're going to give you Ativan. We're going to intubate you. Uh, we're going to put a catheter in you and you have to do everything we tell you. And this is something that Terry and I are huge advocates for, is making sure that people know that even if you are sick, even if you are a patient, you still have rights. Just because a doctor tells you something or suggests something does not mean you have to go by what they say. Now, obviously, you have to weigh the pros and the cons, the risks of doing or not doing. But you are still free, right, and 21, and you still have a right to say no. They like to make you believe that you don't, and all of a sudden you're a child who has to do everything they tell you, and that's just not the case. Um, like, for example, when I got there today, they had not let him have any food or water for 24 hours. And I said, why doesn't he have any water? He hasn't had anything to drink since I left here last night. And they go, oh, no, he has to, have, he has to take a swallow test. And I said, no, he doesn't. They go, well, yes, he does. I said, no, he doesn't. He's taken umpteen swallow tests when he got the trach put in at USC two years ago. Those are all in his files if you cared to look. And if you don't, I don't really care because he's been eating and drinking for two years. You cannot have him here for 12 hours without any water. And they said, well, we're still going to give him a swallow test. I said, no, you're going to give him some water right now or I will go buy some and give it to him myself. This is the kind of way that you, and I don't like having to act like this, but you have to do this because they just go in there and they think they can do whatever they want and it's the patient that suffers. So anyway, uh, as of right now, uh, I he is still in ICU, but it's mainly because they're not gonna bother moving him unless they need the room for an emergency because the plan is that he will hopefully get out of the hellhole of Palmdale Regional Medical Center tomorrow. Um, so he is still in ICU, but he is stable. Um, he was on a ventilator earlier because they were worried that he wasn't breathing. This was this morning when they're like, he's not breathing. Um, so they put him on a ventilator and then they watched him and they slowly weaned him off. The, the respiratory team today has been pretty good. Um, they slowly weaned him off as of about three o'clock. He came off the ventilator He's been breathing with just oxygen like he does at home, and he's been fine. Uh, his heart rate is good. Um, his blood pressure goes up a little bit, but then it, it levels back out. And his heart rate has been consistently like 95, 96, 97. 
Uh, so that's really good for him. Um, if he exerts himself in any way, because he still has pneumonia, it does drop. It'll drop down to like 91, 92, um, sometimes maybe 90. Um, but if he's not, if he's not exerting himself and he's calm and he's just there chilling, it's, it's between 95 and 97, which is really good for him. Uh, so he is stable and, uh, he's off the ventilator. And so now we're just trying to keep him stable and, and good until we can get him to USC. He's not very comfortable. Um, <coughs> excuse me, not very comfortable, not only because he's at Palmdale, Ugh, I always sneeze twice. Not only because he's at Palmdale Regional, but also because um, they're not giving him any pain medicine. They gave him Tylenol, which doesn't do anything for him. And um, he does have, because of the pneumonia, he is having pain. Like, the, his lungs hurt. His back's hurting because of his lungs. He's feeling pressure and pain and tightness in his chest. And that's all the infection. So he's not feeling great. Um, but he's definitely better now than he was when I got to the hospital at 10 a.m. this morning. Um, so we're just hoping for a calm night and stable numbers. And then hopefully tomorrow we get him transferred to USC. And then once he's there, I'm sure everything will start getting better because it always has in the past. Um, and thank you, Daniel. Yeah, um, I'm sorry he's going through this too. I told him jokingly, I said, your goal is to... Have one year, 2024, where you're not in the hospital. Well, we'll try for 2025 because we didn't make it this year. So um, I will keep you guys updated. But tomorrow uh, is going to be a big day with getting him moved. And then after that, I will start my commuting to and from L.A. every single day. So um, I will try to keep updated with everybody, but bear with me. And then also I'll be posting on Facebook. But... Just to let everybody know, there's not going to be a live show on Saturday. Um, and Terry's, pr we talked about it today in the hospital room. He, we're, he's probably going to take like probably up about a month off from doing the live show. Um, just until he recovers. Because honestly, I'm thinking, I'm believing that if he gets transferred to USC tomorrow, which is Thursday, I'm assuming he'll be there through the weekend. I don't think they're going to end up releasing him by Friday. So he'll probably be there until, I would assume, the middle of next week at least. So I don't even think he'll be home to be able to do the live show this Saturday. Um, and then even when he comes home, he needs to take some time to recover. So um, that is the update. I will try to keep you guys updated as as things go along. Um, a line here to line there, here or there. But um, just keep your fingers crossed and keep praying because he is stable right now. And hopefully that persists until we get him to USC. And then everything will hopefully start getting better and getting him back on the mend. Okay. All right. That's the update. I'm going to go. I got to get to bed because I have to get up at six to be back there at eight um, because Terry wants me there at eight because we don't know when this transfer is going to happen. So, all right. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.